Testing, testing. Can we start? Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of the three um, panels that will be featuring the winners of Sigma Awards. My name is Quack Sir Guang King. You can just call me King. I'm actually the data editor at the Pulitzer Center, but today I'm here um, in my capacity as the competition officer of Sigma Awards. And I believe many of you should know here that the Sigma Awards is the only global competition for data journalism. And this award is supported by Google, so thank you very much. Today, uh, we are going to talk about some of the projects that won the Sigma Awards 2023. So today, we have uh, three winners here. We also have another panel tomorrow, as well as the day after. Um, talking about other projects um, that won the awards. So today, I'm, it's my pleasure to have three speakers here. Uh, they are Klaus von Deiken, the co-founder and director of Lighthouse Reports. We have uh, Gert Kutzman, editor-in-chief of Streets Block. We also have Claudia Baez, co-founder and CEO of Question Publica. Um, just to let everyone know that, um, you can find all the details of all the winning projects on the website of Sigma Awards. Can we show the, my computer, please? Yeah. So this is where you're able to find all the projects. Not just the winners. We have all the winners. We have 11 winners this year. You can also find all the other projects that were submitted to the Sigma Awards. And in each project, you're able to see the details. For example, the committee's comments, the prize committee's comments, the project descriptions, and most important, the techniques and the technologies used to produce the project. So we believe that this is a collective knowledge from the data journalism community, and we want to share uh, with the larger community so that we can learn from each other. And that is also the purpose of the three panels that we are having together um, in uh, IJF this year. So without further ado, I would like to invite Klaas to present uh, about the work behind his project. I'm going to do the presentation. I have to push a button. Great. All right. Is it working now? Can everybody hear me? Yeah? OK. Um, my name is Klaas van Dijk, and I'm one of the directors of, of Lighthouse Reports. Um, we, we were very, very honored to, that we won a Sigma Award this year. Uh, we actually won it for, for two of the projects, but for the sake of time, I will just focus on uh, the, the project which is called Uncovering the Malia Massacre, uh, which is a visual investigation into an event that happened in, um, on, the, on June 24th last year. Um, Gert asked me last night and this morning again um, if, if I could add in a little, little joke here or there or to give it a little bit of light into the topic, but um, unfortunately, it is, it is quite a heavy topic, so a little warning ahead that uh, some of the footage you will see could be, could be experienced as, as a little bit of disturbing. Um, but first, maybe for those who don't know what uh, and who we are, who Lighthouse is, Lighthouse Reports is a non-profit newsroom. Um, we initiate innovative investigative uh, uh, projects uh, journalistic projects. We work with media from, from Europe and beyond. Um, we, our investigations that we initiate are open for all newsrooms. Um, everybody can join um, and together we, we are able to do innovative, uh, innovative projects. Um, the unique thing about Lighthouse Reports is that we uh, can add uh, specialisms like open source investigators, we have money trails, we have uh, data science and a data team, uh, and we can do 3D modeling. Um, for this project, we, we worked with media um, with El País in Spain, 
uh, in us uh, from Morocco uh, with the Spiegel Germany and Le Monde in France. We also worked with independent journalists from Sudan and from Spain. Um, we all choose them with, with care, um, but I will come back to that slightly later first. Um, maybe a little bit of the background on the story and how that started. Um, the, um, yeah, if you can play the video. Um, the video will just play in the background while I will talk you quickly through the story. On, on the 24th of June last year, um, there were a group of men, from, mainly from Sudan, around 1,500, who were chased down the mountain, uh, mountainous area in Morocco, in Nador. Um, they, they were forced off that place towards, and they wanted to cross into Europe, into the Spanish exclave of um, uh, Melilla that uh, they were heavily under attack by uh, both the Moroccan forces and, and the Spanish Guardia Civil. Um, and that day, uh, at least 23 people, probably much more uh, died, were crushed in a stampede um, or died um, in, in, in another way. And um, 77 people uh, are still missing. Um, but both Morocco and Spain deny to answer the, the questions, and most importantly, they, for example, Spain said that, not, that there were no crimes committed that day, that they didn't uh, violate any human rights, and that nobody died on their Spanish soil. Um, we, we saw videos coming, uh, emerging on, on social media from that day, uh, videos like the next, the next one. Um, uh, sorry, can go to the next slide. Um, they they were quite disturbing. Uh, we you can see how people were were crushed, um, but and we collected all these videos because we had the feeling that okay, we we probably as Lighthouse reports have to do an investigation into into this, and um, we. We collected around 150 videos, um, but the videos in itself, like this, they, they don't tell a whole story. It's, it's quite difficult to understand what this uh, is actually about. Um, so we decided to, um, to put those videos on a timeline and to, to, work, to start working on the reconstruction of the day, a visual reconstruction. Um, and... Um, if you can, yeah. Um, Donde, and, entonces, la guardia está um, we, we wanted to, to build a 3D model um, in order to place all the videos in, in time and, and space in order to tell the story. But we figured that we, we didn't have enough material to go on to, um, to really see where, where things were happening. So we asked uh, Beatrice, who is, who is also here present, I uh, was an investigative journalist at Lighthouse Reports to, to go to, to the border crossing. She talked herself into the border crossing, sp spoke to the Guardia Civil, who also um, were able to tell, in, or in their opinion, where the, the Spanish border was. Um, and we used that footage that she filmed to, to build a 3D, uh, a very detailed 3D model. Next one. With that 3D model, we asked um, Samir we, to show... If you can, yeah. um, with that 3D model, we were all also able to bring that to survivors who survived the day, who are still in Morocco. Um, and we, we found survivors by working, for example, with, with a Sudanese journalist, Aziz Al-Nur, um, who, who was able to track down uh, these people. And we, we showed them the model and they were able to, to tell them where they were, at what time, at what, and um, what place. We also presented the model to, um, to whistleblowers within the Guardia Civil itself, um, because Spiegel had a, had, a great, had a great journalist working for them with good sources. Um, they showed us material that they, they weren't allowed to, to show to the public, but where you could see where forces, where, where people were crushed, um, um, how, how the events evolved during the day. And he made us a little drawing, and that matched exactly with, with our model. Um, and he said, yeah, probably 
people did die on, on Spanish soil. And then in the end, we, we were um, able to, to put most of the videos in at the right place at the right time. And we were able to, to demonstrate um, how uh, people most likely did die, um, and at least one person did die on, on the Spanish side of the, of the border. And not only that, um, Spain denied also that it, it knew what was happening on the Moroccan side, um, where people were beaten, heavily beaten, where people were uh, crushing. They, this is leaked footage from, from that, that was leaked to the press. Um, and in the background of that footage, you can see how Moroccan forces are heavily beating people who already were um, well, on top of each other, because they, they were trying to, to reach Spain. Not only that, the, the, the Spanish government or the Spanish Guardia Civil took the people who made it to the other side of the border crossing. Um, instead of uh, allowing them to ask for asylum, they uh, put them together, they were beating them, um, and then they were sending them back into, into that place where people were already uh, crushing. Um, the the press after we released this this video there was a, a huge amount of pressure on on the Spanish government and despite the unrefute, irrefutable evidence that we that we presented um, they are still denying that they were doing this um, but yeah thank you very much um, no sorry there's one one thing that I would like to add here is that projects like this. Um, I think can, can only be done by, by working together, uh, by putting media together from different countries, uh, journalists with different perspectives, perspectives with deep local knowledge, um, with people who have a specialized uh, or have um, a specialist research skills, um, and only then you can do the most innovative um, and ambitious project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, uh, to class. Um, this is um, an investigation that used you know, advanced visual investigation techniques. Um, next, uh, we are going from uh, the Europe to the New York City. Um, next, we have Gertz um, from Streets Block to talk about his winning project that is uh, Always Scared. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> So that's a tough act to follow. Our investigation was about high, the high rate of car crashes in New York City. It was conducted by an investigative journalist on my staff named Jesse Coburn, who is just an incredibly diligent and creative uh, investigative journalist. And I've been in the business for about 32 years, and he's the best reporter I've ever worked with. Um, he couldn't be here because his mother is getting married in Tampa, Florida. So he chose Tampa over Umbria, uh, which is his loss, I guess. Anyway. So this, uh, like all great stories, this story started with a personal obsession. Uh, when my kids, uh, let's go to slide two, when my kids uh, started going to school, I quickly noticed that the roads around their schools are chaotic and anxiety producing. Now in New York City where I live, most people's interaction with public roadways is simply walking a few blocks to the subway or to the bus stop. But after having kids, many New Yorkers experience the roadways differently. You're constantly walking children around, you're waiting for them, you're watching them playing inches away from traffic with 3,000 pound metal machines moving very rapidly. Now many New Yorkers respond uh, to this fear in the way that many Americans respond to fear generally, and that is buying their own weapon, in this case a protective case uh, of a car. And that way makes, that allows their children to be exceptionally safe while putting everybody else at even more danger. So the results of course are disastrous for everyone. Yet very few New Yorkers are even aware of it, which brings me to my first point, which was the question they wanted us to answer, why did our investigation matter? So first, let's look at the scope of the problem in New York City. Here's a map of all of the times a car hit something in the year 2022, just one year. Each dot represents a crash. The bigger the dot, the more crashes at any given location. Now there's about 103,000 dots on that map. It's a relatively small 
spot on the globe, but there's 103,000 crashes on that map. That's about 282 car crashes every day in New York City. Now, there used to be about twice as many dots on the annual map, but the police department in New York City got so overwhelmed by responding to so many crashes that they actually stopped responding to crashes that don't have injuries. But nonetheless, there's still about 110 New Yorkers injured or killed every day by car crashes. Now, the reason so few people don't know, so few people know that in New York is, for t is actually twofold. One is America's car culture has run so deep in our society for about 100 years that the car is as basic a tool of American life as a fork or a hamburger bun. It's not questioned in any way. Even in a city of New like New York where we have a tremendous subway system, runs all day and all night, plus buses that go to all corners of the city. So as a result of people ignoring this uh, problem, the negative effects of the car, the noise, the destruction, the violence, the pollution, the sprawl, the congestion, are sort of whitewashed away so that no one is forced to feel bad about the political decisions that everybody else has made to enable that lifestyle. And that creates car dependency. So the second reason very few people know about road violence, especially in New York, is that uh, dry, uh, our culture is conditioned to treat all crashes, even fatal ones, as accidents. Now you notice I'm using the American quote marks here, I could be European. Um, because we don't use that term accident in my website, which covers road violence. The reason is drivers who speed or drive recklessly don't get into accidents. They've made a decision and the crash is a result of that bad decision. Similarly, roads that are designed solely for the use and misuse of cars to move rapidly through residential neighborhoods, uh, those aren't accidents. Those are results of a bad decision and, b and a bad political process. Now, to understand why those bad decisions keep happening, you need data. But in New York City, car and pedestrian volumes on any given street, are, they're not tracked. So the government doesn't know, for example, how many cars are on a given road at any given time and doesn't know how many pedestrians are on a given road at any given time. Neither is the race or the socioeconomic status of the victims of road violence known, or, or even the age of the victim isn't properly tracked. Um, we do know that a disturbing number of crashes occur in neighborhoods with high poverty or with high populations of people of color, but actual rates of crashes aren't possible, and this is frustrating, and it leads to really bad political decisions and also a lot of bad journalism in New York. So question two they wanted us to answer is, what is the problem which was solved by, and what was the innovative approach? So as I said, the main problem with the database of crashes in New York City is that it only offers the location of the crash. In order to see whether the crashes are concentrating for some geographic reason, you need, a, you need to build a new database, a spatial database, if you will, to map those crashes along with other factors, such as maybe there are a lot of parking lots in a given neighborhood. Maybe there are a lot of drive-through restaurants. We have drive-through restaurants in America. And, and maybe there are a lot of schools, for example. So the other problem, of course, is that in New York City, like most places, the government doesn't track and indeed doesn't even know, like I said, how many people are using the roads. Now, one of our sponsors, Google, knows that stuff. They, everyone's got a phone in their pocket. They know where everybody's going, but the government doesn't know. So we know when the times, we know the times of the crashes, but we don't know, uh, uh, but, but no one's ever sifted out the times from the database. So for example, we were studying school crashes. We we're mostly interested when, when students arrive and leave, the so-called pick up and drop off hours at a school. The rest of the day they're in the classroom, they're not in any danger. So what, what our reporter had to do is sift out those times. So the first chart, when he sifted out the times, you'll notice we th it created this first chart. Now this is an interesting chart because basically what it shows is that the red line is crashes near schools, the blue line is crashes everywhere else. And you see that at around 7 a.m. when kids are arriving at school, the crashes almost double. When about two o'clock when they start leaving school till about six o'clock when they're all out of school, the crashes are also significantly higher. Now, if you compare that to the next chart, the next chart is crashes when school is not in session, both around schools and, and away from schools. It's basically the same. So when the school's not in session, same number of crashes. When school is in session during the morning and afternoon, crashes go up. So now in pushing back on this story, the New York City Department of Transportation argued that the busiest streets will always have more crashes, and streets with schools on them tend to be busier because many people drive to schools. But if you think about that, and if you accept that rationale, 
City officials are suggesting that they don't need to act because, well, there's always going to be crashes in places that people want to go. But it's not our job as journalists to accept that. In fact, it's our job to point out when crashes are happening near schools, the most vulnerable people in our society are at risk. And that's something I think the Department of Transportation should be very focused on. Now, the last question they wanted me to address was, what was the innovative approach? So what I said is, we only have a database of crashes, geolocated geo with what it, longitude and latitude, and the times, et cetera. But we don't know where, whether there are geographic factors affecting that. So what we had to do is build an entirely new shapefile and merge that with the crash database. The shapefile for us was, was um, the, the shape of schools. That, that, ma that didn't exist either. We had to build that shapefile. And then on top of that, we had to do another, add another database of all the racial breakdown and socioeconomic breakdown of all the schools. That information is also known, but it's in a completely different place on PDFs and had to be scraped. Now, I'm not going to tell a room full of journalists how, to, how Coburn did this, but basically he wrote a 70-line Postgres query to join all this data. And what he did is he took all the crashes since July 2015, and that's hundreds of thousands of crashes in New York. As I said, there's, there's 200,000 crashes a year. So he's got about a couple of million crashes, and then he joined it to geolocate them within 250 feet of a school. So once he was finished, the database led to previously unknown discoveries. Well, I mean, unknown to public officials, but known to anybody with eyes, like, like me and my kids, that there's way more traffic violence around schools. For instance, there are about 57% more crashes and 25% more injuries per mile on school streets than on other city streets during those pickup and drop off hours. And 43% higher amounts of crashes outside ma majority black or brown schools than outside majority white schools. A lot of factors are, uh, once we determine that, we could then discuss the reasons that's happening, why the schools are located in a certain place, et cetera. So what's the takeaway? Oh, so let me just give you two more maps of that. Just this is what his, he made some tableau maps. Uh, the, the, the blue is the schools on the, and the red are the crashes near the schools. Go to the next one. It was also interactive in the sense you could click on each crash and find out how many um, injuries there were. That was a good, good feature because people would find their school and then click all over it. So what's the takeaway? Well, I think the story demonstrates that, the s that seemingly unrelated databases can contain important newsworthy stories when you join them in, a, in an innovative way. And that uh, obviously injustice can hide even in commonplace activities. Most journalists, and, and I only work with transportation journalists, we're fascinated by this, but most journalists really don't see uh, any real journalistic value in the very commonplace action of walking to school every day. It's just not something that people talk about. You know, my kid was walking to school. You know, well, what happened? Well, a big car almost hit him. Anyway, so the closer scrutiny showed that the topic uh, w was really disconnected from the public discourse. And that scrutiny, by the way, extends far beyond road violence to the larger deleterious impact of cars on our entire civilization. And it's fortunate we're here in Europe because you can even see it here. Stretches of the urban core of this beautiful city are actually pedestrianized, and as such, they're very wonderful gathering places for people. King, if you could show the next slide. You know, you could just sit on the, on the piazza, car-free piazza, and really enjoy yourself and, and, and think and hear and talk and laugh. But even here in Europe, even in beautiful Perugia, uh, you have residents who don't want to give up what they consider their parking. And you'll notice that I use the air quotes again. This is a public space in the picture. But this public space doesn't belong to the 11 car drivers who have commandeered it. It actually belongs to all the citizens of Perugia, yet has been taken by those, by, I'd imagine, a slightly wealthier minority of people who own cars and, and believe that the public space belongs to them. And the last thing I want to say is this story also reminds us that the best data journalism cannot and must not ignore the human angle. The title of the story, Always Scared, comes from the, something that one of the victims of road violence told Jesse Coburn. Um, here she is. This is Rogi Kebe. She's a woman whose daughter was killed by a driver near her, near her daughter's school. But she still has to walk her two other young children to school every day, to the same kindergarten where her daughter attended and was killed. They walk a different route these days so, so that Kebby doesn't have to cross the street where Marianne was killed by the reckless driver because, as she said, she is always scared of traffic violence. So, thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, um, Gertz. Mm, I can't stop but, you know, to observe that this panel is actually a reflection of the diversity among the winners of Sigma Awards. So you can see we started with cross-border, 
multiple newsrooms collaboration in Europe, going to a small non-profit um, newsrooms in New York City, and next we are going to Colombia and to look at Game of Thrones in Colombia, uh, produced by a large newsroom there. Claudia, floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Claudia Baez. I'm a director and co-founder of uh, Question Publica. This is a media investigative independent outlet uh, based in Colombia. Thank you. We are uh, doing investigative journalism and we use uh, data journalism and OSINT techniques to make investigative journalism uh, more uh, accurate, deepest and faster. Um, in Question Publica, we love to create news apps. This is our last uh, news apps uh, for uh, legislative and presidential elections last year. And we use the narrative of Game of Thrones to uh, explain a complex phenomenon uh, from political houses, families in Colombia that uh, retain, maintain the power, they control the territories with power and money, and they have decades by decades uh, with the same families uh, maintain uh, the power. So next slide. I want to just see this video. This is the intro of a uh, game of votes. This video was made uh, by a video producer in Colombia in 3D modeling, and we uh, created this video to uh, captive uh, the young first uh, time voters and young voters. Um, Game of Votes is the investigation of the money trail contracts and islands of the political clans, political families in Colombia in their dispute for the 2020 elections in Colombia. Uh, we decided uh, which families, in Colombia there, there are 57 political families uh, in the territory, and we identified the 10 families most powerful that could be an influence in the elections. So next one. So that's why, inspired by the HBO TV series, we uh, built this universe to attract uh, these young voters to be interested in how is the mechanism, what is the mechanism for these um, families to retain the power? And uh, how are the connections between the wealthy families and political campaigns? We, can you go up? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the most important part here, it was the section of candidates we can identify the candidates from these political families that were uh, uh, wanted a, a seat in the Congress 
and uh, wanted uh, a support a uh, presidential candidate to run off the office, run for the office. Yeah, next one. So uh, the innovative approach in of these uh, news apps is the narrative is across the whole website. Every uh, word that we put in these news apps, it's uh, in a medieval uh, narrative and discourse and speech. Um, what was the challenge? For political families in Colombia sound really familiar for, for the people, but uh, they are not clear how they work. So uh, to the first time and young voters in Colombia, they needed to learn how they do to maintain their power. So Labour of Votes explained a complex phenomenon in a simple way of uh, the phenomenon is the accumulation of power and political business structures in a way that is understandable to a citizen. How their vote contribute, contribute to their um, power, the power of these houses. So the candidate sanction in our new app shows which candidate you should not vote in order to uh, avoid that these political houses uh, stay in the power. Um, we, we think that the pop culture is a way to engage uh, new audiences. We have a cool narrative, uh, we, have, we invest a lot in design, invest in time and resources, because we wanted to really be very close to the Game of Thrones um, um, world, and not to be a bad uh, version of, that, of it. So that's what we, we have a uh, house uh, words, a small council, the hand of the king. Each political house has this small council when you can see who is the king, who is the master of the coin, who is the land council, the war council, the government council. All the investigative journalists that was involved in this investigation was immersed in this world and created and identified in the political spectrum in Colombia which people could be the role of this uh, universe of Game of Thrones and, and Colombia. So um, can you, the political houses concept uh, was uh, really uh, difficult. I mean, the, the investigation was not easy because it's, um, it's really a bunch of data, uh, a huge bunch of, uh, of, uh, amount of data. We uh, tracked 22 databases in Colombia and abroad and cross-reference analyzes, visualizes to have the findings of uh, in, in the four sections that the application has. And um, the, um, another thing that is uh, very uh, interesting in this application is uh, how we can use the um, folklore, Colombian culture, to cross with the popular culture in a universal uh, understanding. This is the four sections of the news apps. It's the house members. We track uh, 499 uh, members, uh, house members in 10 houses. The resource, I mean the companies related to these house members. Uh, the public offices and procurement, how they uh, copped the procurement system to pay their own campaigns to run for uh, the Congress and for the presidential or for the, all the, 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 um, the positions in the, um, in the state, you know? And the, all, the, the last one is the candidate to elections. The hit is we mix something from popular culture with something the audiences identifies with Colombian culture. This package is perfect for rigorous, accurate, in-depth uh, investigative data driving reporting. This is the a small council that you see. Every house has this council. And uh, in the time we launched a game of bond, a game of votes, there was the House of the Dragon uh, spin-off, uh, and so we take advantage of the new series of the Dragons hype. And we create TikToks and Reels videos uh, of a game of votes, political houses, to increase engagement 
with the app and its information even after Congress and presidential elections. Also, we paid for digital advertising in Instagram and uh, Facebook because we wanted that uh, people in the regions of these political houses has influence could really get this information before vote. Uh, so we reached uh, 300 and 350,000 uh, people um, in, in with this advertising. This is our team. We have uh, investigative journalism, um, data scientists, fact-checking, uh, lawyers, um, a rich uh, team, data uh, uh, developers, designers, uh, video producers, musicians, uh, editors. I mean, it's a huge uh, team to, to really get a game of bot. And there is a, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you so much uh, for all three of our speakers. So um, I think we are doing quite good on time. We have about 13 minutes um, before we break for lunch. Um, so I would like to open up the next sessions for the floor for any questions that you have. You. Raise your hands, please. One, two. All right, we'll um, get two questions for the first round. Should I pass the mic or? Um, I guess this is a question for all of you. I mean, first, thanks for sharing. I really enjoyed the different approaches um, to those investigations. But I'm more interested in what the impact was and, um, you know, how did audiences take it? And I, I guess, Claudia, especially in the case of the Game of Thrones, how did you get any feedback from the people that you featured <laughs> in this as well? Yes, um, for the people that we investigate, uh, that are involved in the, I mean, in the houses, the members of the houses, we got allegations. They don't want it to, to be in the app, and they wanted to take out their note from the app. We refused that because uh, our investigation is based, I mean, we, if you see, we have a huge uh, team of fact checkers. I mean, it's, it's huge to, to fact checking all the, uh, the proof and uh, in, in 499 notes for people and 366 notes for uh, for companies. So it's, it's a, a huge, huge app and every entity in that app could say that's not true. So that's why we have a huge uh, people and fact checking and lawyers to see the app before releasing it. So this allegation was refused for question publica because there was no uh, any uh, solid argument to, to do it. And from the people, uh, uh, people love it. I mean, uh, that was a really uh, different thing in the um, election coverage in Colombia. Something really innovative for young people. And they take interest, they was very interested in how to explore the, the application. So that's why we paid uh, for advertising. That was a really good decision because we reached really uh, more people and now also we paid in Instagram uh, a small media outlet also that had 500,000 uh, uh, followers in Instagram, so half of the million. And they uh, put the video of uh, Game of Votes and the findings of Game of Votes with their audience, the young people, and that was really a good, uh, good uh, I mean, the answer for the people was really good. We have I, I, would, I would just jump in and say, um, in, in the story about the crashes, the impact, the main impact of that is you're giving the entire advocacy community and the political establishment um, a new tool they didn't have before, which is, oh, roads around schools are dangerous. We probably should do something about that. And so in terms of readership, you know, it's not hundreds of thousands of readers like, you know, Claudia is talking about, but, you know, it's important to have that knowledge. Um, and for, for the Malia Massacre, um, I think we had impact on at least three different levels, on a political level in um, in, and in Europe. Um, so it was presented in the European Parliament, uh, I think twice. Um, there, and there are follow-up questions uh, from uh, MEPs. 
Um, in Spain, uh, it put a lot of pressure on, on the government and especially the Minister of Interior. Um, I got chased by, by the spokesperson of the Ministry of in Interior. He was basically stalking me to, to reveal the confidential sources up to Christmas Eve. He was messaging me. Um, but then, maybe more importantly, um, we, we were able to, to connect uh, some of the people who were there to, to lawyers, um, and they are trying to follow up on this uh, as well. Only one thing more. Um, we also had um, Instagram Live with a famous Instagrammer in Colombia uh, during, uh, before the elections. So we reached there in real time 3,500 people with these Instagrammers to twice, twice shows. Yeah. Right, um, just for your information, you can get more details about the impacts of each project on the Sigma Awards website, actually. Uh, we put all the impacts um, and other details of each project uh, on that website. Um, we have another questions, right, from there, yeah. Oh, three more questions, cool. Thank you. Um, hi, and my question's for Gert. Um, yeah, I was really interested in your story because I'm a former data journalist and a big active travel fan. So, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask a bit more about, um, you, you briefly touched on um, the ways in which the local government kind of pushed back, but I wonder if you could say a bit more about what their response was. And then also, um, yeah, I'd be interested to know a bit more specifically about if it's been taken up by kind of, um, transportation kind of travel advocates. I know like I'm in I live in London and we have um, a really cool thing that I'm sure you've heard of called like school streets where they do timed closures. Right. That's my local like primary school does that which I think is obviously a bit controversial whenever you tell people they can't drive their car but um, it's they've been largely successful. So yeah, that's my two. Kind of yeah, in fact, uh, we, we on our website we've been using the London example of, of school streets and the Paris example of school streets as a model for what we should do in New York. Um, you know, in, well, first of all, the, the agencies in question, the Department of Transportation, really pushed back on the story because um, they don't necessarily see that uh, there's a value in, in, in crunching the numbers the way we did. As far as the Department of Education goes, the Department of Education was downright hostile to the story. They don't think there's any role at all for the agency in keeping kids safe outside the school. In fact, the, the main um, discussion of violence in New York is about crime, which is actually substantially lower than road violence. Um, and in fact, the Department of Education spends most of its time when it, term, when it talks about keeping kids safe um, only as uh, inside the school buildings, because in America we have obviously a lot of mass shootings and a, a big portion of them have take place in school, so they talk about metal detectors, but they never concern themselves with the, how the kids get to school. So that's one thing. Um, and, and as far as school streets, I mean, a lot of the advocacy community is talking about um, opening up streets. I, we say open streets, but they're closing the streets to car drivers during certain hours, and it's something that is n stunningly controversial because um, most of the schools in New York City are on residential streets or on qu relatively quiet streets, yet the prospect of barring car drivers from those streets for just an hour, you know, where they'd have to make a small detour, is incredibly controversial. There's a, a roadway uh, in one neighborhood that was made car free for about 15 blocks, and there's like six schools on that block, on, on that stretch, and you see every morning the kids walking down the street safe and, and, and secure, and then there are drivers in that community who, who say that, that doing that has made the neighborhood less safe in some way. That's how convoluted it is uh, when it comes to car driving in New York. Um, I would like to get both questions before we get the panelists mm -hmm. to answer. I think there are two hands, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my name is Chibi K. I'm from Nigeria Health Watch. Um, my question is to Claudia. I was just curious to know if you had any copyright issues with um, adopting the GOT um, strategy or you know the, the movie, or you took care of that before before you put out the work. Thanks. Oh, let's get other questions before we answer all of them. Issues regarding what? Sorry, I didn't get it. Oh, you didn't get it? This was the most expensive project in the whole, in our history. We, ha we are a uh, media outlet for with five years of, of life. And uh, without uh, the people from the staff, I mean, from, from members of Cousin Publica, uh, we expend like uh, fifteen thousand dollars, 
but without the people uh, in house, okay? And this is, uh, we uh, um, had people uh, in freelance, a lot of people in freelance, and uh, we didn't pay for the music, for, for example. Um, but we paid a lot in design, 3D modeling, by video, and all that. So that, that was the most expensive for us. I was just going to add, we didn't really have a budget. It's just Jesse's salary, and we took some pictures and made some maps. And Cheryl, um, maybe we can have one more question, very quick one. Hi, I'm Cheryl Phillips with Global News at Stanford. I was just curious um, on these projects, if, if you have any components that are reproducible. So um, I, the question about, like with um, uh, putting videos on a timeline, for example, I mean, is there any piece of that that could be generalized out so because I um, could imagine that could be a problem or a challenge for other projects and then the same idea with the traffic uh, crashes because I know that there's traffic crash data in fact I had a student working on some out of San Jose in California what could be done to build some kind of reproducibility here for to scale these kinds of projects to other places um, some parts will be of course, with, with visual investigations, it really relies on, on the event itself, um, and you have to analyze the, the different videos, um, and that's really manual work. Uh, but then there, are, so there is software that can be used um, that help to, to put things on a timeline. Um, but also, for example, I know that our um, uh, the, the person who, who built the 3D model used, for example, LID LIDAR data. Um, and that was that's quite new, um, but it's it proven to be very helpful to to use that kind of data to to build 3D uh, 3D models of of, uh, of cities or places where, of course, this this kind of data is available. Um, I'm, I'm not across every detail of, of that, but I he, he assured me that that speed up the the process quite quite a bit. I, I would just add to that. I, I actually don't know how other cities. Um, collect the database, uh, create a database of crashes. Uh, in New York City, for example, we have um, s speed enforcement cameras, which creates a massive trove of data about where, where people are speeding. Other places around the country, California, Texas, they've actually banned those cameras, so you don't, you don't have any of that data. And as far as crashes go, so, so I wouldn't even know how to tell you how to replicate it because the data is probably, may not even be available. Um, some of my colleagues in San Francisco, for example, say, you know, how do you know so much about crashes? I'm like, I don't know anything about crashes. It's just Mayor Bloomberg, you know, who's a tech, tech billionaire, actually created the open data portal in New York City, which before then, you didn't know anything. So he, you know, and we're all living with that very good data. Now there's millions of lines of code of crashes. I don't, I don't know what other cities do. Yeah. Um, our methodology is replicable. I mean, um, it, this is a unique, a uh, way to to make this a uh, huge investigation and this is the cross references but the workflow is uh, i mean it takes a lot of time to 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 analyze and to investigate a, a political house so we have um a systematic thing to find to 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 have the findings of of these uh, political houses we look at the um, financial campaigns, into a procurement system, into the, the whole databases, open databases that we can find in Colombia and abroad to just find how is the money trail of, of these houses. So it's completely replicable. All right, I think time is up. And thank you uh, very much to three of our speakers <laughs> and for everyone who is here. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Oh, well done. Well done.